from here and use it for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Welcome. Happy that you're here. And, uh, you know, I always wonder when people come in here and it's a different kind of service, you hear the music that's different and, and what goes on in people's minds. And, and for me, it's a matter of perspective to, to look at and view at life through a lens that allows you to enter a different dimension. Because the truth of it is, the truth of it is, when I start to think about like the lyrics of that song, I'll fly away and understand that all the pressures of today all have a day that they come to an end and you enter another dimension. And that's what God has secured to us through what Jesus did on that cross. Amen? And so that's as real as I'm standing here in front of you right now. Right? That's as real as I'm standing in front of you right now. Every one of us has an expiration date. Amen? And so you're going to take your last breath here, and you're going to begin again. It's either going to be an eternity with the Lord, or it's going to be in a place called hell. That's reality. And so one of the things that's helped me on my journey uh, in the topic of tonight uh, really was sobering for me, because I... I had an opportunity this week to really fine-tune my thinking because I seen something uh, by way of a real experience in dealing with some things this week that, boy, it really refined my thoughts for tonight. And, and so what helps on the spiritual journey with, with characters such as myself or others that have struggled with rebellion? How many have struggled with rebellion by an amen? Amen? Yeah, and because you think you know how to chart your own course better than, than someone else, right? Usually when we were younger, a lot of times it was with your parents, and then it might have morphed into law enforcement, right? And, and then, you know, so to have a sober perspective of reality, you know, have to be under the authority of God. Amen? So that's, a, that's easy for me to consider because I understand he has the right answers and I don't when there's a conflict. And so to submit to be under his authority is huge. I didn't realize, you know, as you go through the years and you're walking with the Lord and, and the scriptures have an influence in your life, you don't maybe realize to what degree they have an influence on you, right? Well, and I quote a lot of scriptures that paint a picture for you that are very mechanical. In our devotion times, when I'm speaking with our group of people, Somebody will give a very spiritual answer, and I'll say, I want to hear the nuts and bolts of that. What does that mean practically? Right? I can say, do not be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Right? You'll be able to test and approve what God's will is as good as pleasing His perfect will. You'll be able to know that. Right? But what does that mean by the nuts and bolts? means if I take the scriptures and I digest them. It means I read through them and allow them to have an influence on my life. It'll transform me. Amen? And so you know what, what happened? The, the, the cause and effect of understanding one reality, that we must be under the authority of God. We have to put ourselves under the authority of God. And the problem is, so many times that people struggle with, is they will not do that. They will not do that. And so people come in and sometimes they want to have conversations by way of counseling, right? And so I begin to hear what they're saying. And as they're speaking, I realize there is no influence in this individual's life whatsoever based on what the scripture says. Are you hearing me? We call ourselves Christians, amen? All right, we call ourselves Christians. Well, you understand... For us to walk in a new life means we have to step out from where we used to be, the concepts, the, what I believe, what I believe to be true, and I have to allow God to have his way to transform my thinking into something that's solid, like the rock, that's immovable, right? I have to allow that to happen. And so to hear somebody that speaks, that uses the title Christian, that's who I am, right? That's my identity. Well it really sometimes doesn't boil down to anything more than this. It doesn't boil down to anything more than there was a day that they come and they ask the Lord to save them, maybe at an altar call, and that's as deep as it is. So in other words, there's been no, you know, being transformed by the renewing of the mind. 
And as a result, their understanding is still based on the stinking thinking that brought them to the disaster they were in in the first place. Do you hear what I'm telling you? And so when you start to have these conversations, I'm listening, and this week in particular I had one that was like, it was the grand finale of all grand finales. Listening to what I was hearing, because what I was hearing was very clearly just human thinking, based on my own understanding. The Bible says there is a way that seems right to a man, in the end it leads to death, Right? So, so I'm listening to it, and this individual's claiming this identity as Christian and just going on and 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 on. And at some point, I just had to get to the end of that and just start to turn the tide to say, you know what, I understand. I've been there. I understand that kind of thinking. But there's some real truths in Scripture that change us. They, they change us. And they start with being under the authority of God. Being under the authority of God. Allowing him that place. It means that what he says, I'm not going to consider it as one of the options. He said it, that settles it. Amen? All right, I got one amen out of that. I'm going to read a scripture to you in context and then we'll go from there. It's Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 5 through 13. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, asking, help, for asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home, paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell one to go, and he goes, and that one, and that one, the one come, and he comes, and I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When the Lord heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you, many will come from the east and the west and will take their place at the feast of, with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom of heaven will be thrown outside. Into the darkness will there be the weeping and the gashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go. Let it be done just as you believed it would be. And Jesus and, and his servant was healed at that moment. So to break it down, to break it down for you, I'm just going to just cut through it and just start on verse 5 where it said Jesus had entered Capernaum and a centurion came to him asking for help and he said, Lord, my servant is lies at home and he's suffering and he's suffering terribly, he's paralyzed. Jesus said to him, shall I come heal him? And then, and then you get these words. He says, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. And, and I, I would tell you to have, first of all, him to be approached with the mindset that says this guy's paralyzed and suffering terribly. And then when Jesus said, shall I come and heal him? And he says, I don't deserve to have you under my roof. There's a perspective very clearly that there's some things going on in my life that probably are not what they need to be. Amen? Maybe we could be reflective of that and think in terms of similarly that what an honor it is to have the Lord do anything for us he goes on to say, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed. Just say the word, and my servant will be healed. You, know, you understand in Scripture, in Genesis, where it starts out and it begins to talk about creation. Let there be light, and there was light, right? And you, you hear each step-by-step 
the walk through creation and it's the spoken word and then it is. So, so you just say the words and he'll be healed. So says, for I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. But a man under authority, and I, and I really challenge you to think on that one. I myself am a man under authority. And then he has others, he has people that have to answer to him. He tells them what to do and they respond and they do what they're told. However, he himself is a man under authority. And therein lies the problem. Here's where the, the train comes off the tracks for us. Is the being under authority. This individual recognized clearly that he had some shortcomings. He didn't deserve for Jesus to be under the, his own roof. He knew that he had the ability to command something and it would happen. And he says to him, I, I'm a man under authority. And, and so he's taking a, a look at the reality of how powerful it is to be under the command. And so a lot of times we can give commands real easy. Amen? We can see ourselves as the place of the one that's supposed to shout and bark the orders. But how easily can we be the one listening to those orders? You hearing me? The Bible says, do not be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world. You know the funniest thing, not funny, this, it, it's, it's sickening. That we can find ourselves falling in alignment with a lost world. Let me come down on the floor for a minute. We can find ourselves coming into alignment with a lost world. Oh, okay, the scripture tells us we're supposed to be salt and light. Caleb, can you pull me down just a little bit? I'm echoing. We're supposed to be salt and light. And the world is supposed to be illuminated by our willingness to let the scriptures be seen, to let Jesus be seen through our lives, through him transforming us by the renewing of our mind. Amen? All right, so the world is supposed to see a difference in us because we allow God to work through us because we listen to him. Are you with me? And so when we get under pressure, we'll survey the lost. You know what that's like? That's like, that's like being in dis financial distress and going and find a group of bankrupt people and go in there and ask them how to get out of your mess. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Nobody hears me? All right, amen. I got one, Donnie. <laughs> Do you hear how ridiculous that is? But it's a bigger picture than that. It's an unwillingness for us to submit to God's authority. And it's us putting ourselves at the place of authority. So in other words, we can give others instruction, we can, you know, organize and do all these things, but when it comes to receiving instruction and allow that to transform our life, that's where we, the train comes off the track. Because God wants to do amazing things, but he wants to do amazing things through us. Through us. Meaning that we're going to have to look like something different than we do on autopilot. Amen? Amen? means there's going to be some distressed times that you have to submit to something that's different thinking than you were pre-programmed with. Amen? You know, your knee-jerk reaction. How many of you would say by an amen that you have bad knee-jerk reactions? Amen? I mean, the first thought coming into your mind is probably not going to be a good one. Amen? That's how I'm wired too. Amen? <laughs> first thought you're not going to hear coming out of my mouth, certainly not off the pulpit or on the floor here. Because I need to be governed. There's a process. The mind is altered because I'm listening to what the scripture says. And as I make application, it works its way from, its, from my mind to my heart. And from my heart, that becomes an action. An action becomes a behavior. A behavior becomes a habit and then lifestyle. And so there's this change that happens, this transformation. But it all starts with this understanding of the authority of God. And so we struggle with this, allowing God to be in this place of authority. And I'm going to tell you what, I've had a, this has been one of those weeks where I got a lot, 
a lot going on in here. Overseeing somebody who refused, refused to surrender to the authority of God. At best would give a hat tip to God, as in, oh, I believe this, I believe this, but I don't believe this. Right? Have you been there? You flipping through the Bible and you decide, I believe this, you like the way that one sounds, and then you get to here, I don't know if I believe that. It's a very dangerous place to be. So he said, I, for I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one to go, and he goes, and this one to come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. And Jesus heard this, he was amazed. And he said, to those following him, I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. I have found, I have not found anyone in all of Israel with such great faith. I have not found anyone with such great faith. There's just some things going on here I want to look at. First of all, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17, verse 20, says this. He replied, because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move yourself from here to there, and it'll move. Nothing will be impossible for you. You hear that? You know that one. That's probably one you learned if you've been in church in Sunday school. Amen. If you had faith the size of a mustard seed, there's another passage that says you could tell this mountain to uproot itself and cast itself into the sea, and it would obey you. Let me just tell you, in the process of putting this building on this property with a little church on Friar Street that became what it is today, many times we had to speak to mountains and say, get the heck out of the way. You hear what I'm telling you? To see and be part of what we're part of, we had to not be limited to what our natural mind could perceive. We had to be able to step into a dimension that was driven by faith. And you say, well, preacher, then what is faith? Well, let me give you the, the biblical picture. Is Hebrews 11, 1 through 3. I want you to hear it in this context. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. For by it, if people of old received their accommodation by faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that were visible. So basically, you know, Faith is being sure of things hoped for and certain of things unseen. And knowing them to be reality because God said it. Right? And so this text is talking about that, you know, the universe was created by the Word of God. The spoken Word. Let there be and there was. Amen? <clears throat> so, so that's Scripture. And I know I use this one a lot, but I'm going to just... I want to hit for the sake of what we're talking about tonight. Being under the authority of God and understanding what that means. So here, listen to what I'm telling you. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17 says this, All Scripture is God-breathed. It is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Do you hear what I'm telling you? You know what that means? It means from Genesis 1 through Revelation 22, 21, it is the God-breathed Word. Do you hear what I'm telling you? It is not negotiable. There is no wiggle room. I don't get to say I believe this, but I don't believe that. Because as soon as I do that, I just hit the switching station and I go off the track. Because I decide in that moment that I know better than what the Scripture says. Well, preacher, this stuff is hard to hear and hard to think about. The Bible says it's, <clears throat> it's useful for teaching, rebuking, we don't like this, correcting and training in righteousness. We don't like any of those folks, I'm just going to tell you. Teaching suggests you need to learn something. Rebuking, Drew, amen? amen. All right. Correcting, Drew, and training in righteousness, all of us, amen? I'm just messing with you, Drew, you know. But the truth of it is, the part of God breathed. It's not a thought. You hear what I'm telling you? It's not just a thought. It's God breathed. 
It's alive. The scripture is alive. So it has the power to do amazing things in our life. So we put ourselves under the authority. Then you say, well, what is that? What faith is Jesus so impressed with, with this guy? He says, you know, that he hasn't seen any of that, that faith, like that faith. Right? He hasn't seen it. So what is it? I suggest to you we find it in Matthew 8, verse 8 and 9. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. He recognized who he was. Amen? And he recognized who Jesus was with the next words. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. He knew who he was. And then he said this, I'm a man under authority. And so to understand this picture, he put himself under Jesus' authority when he came to him. And so there's this, there's this term that's used in the church, right, a lot of times. There's a term used in the church where you hear Jesus as Savior. But as important as it is to, to know who Christ is as Savior, it's as important to know who he is as Lord. As Lord. So this Roman officer, he put his faith and he put himself under Jesus' authority. Amen? And so, to get that, all right, he uses this picture. He uses a picture here. Um, and he's talking about that the Gentiles will be sharing at the table in the kingdom of heaven with Israel's patriarchs. And he adds, the sons of the kingdom will not be there. They'll be cast into outer darkness where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the sons of the kingdom is a Jewish term for the, Nisra the nation of Israel, right? It was commonly known. And, and so Jesus is saying being born in the, you know, naturally in that isn't going to put you at a place guaranteeing heaven. That was the school of thought with the Jewish people. And so, so get your mind wrapped around it. So you, know, so you being born into a Christian family doesn't secure your place in heaven. Did you hear what I'm saying? In other words, we have to come to the place to recognize, you know, that we are not worthy for him to, underneath, to enter underneath our roof. Outside of what Jesus did on that cross, we don't have that identity. He gave us that identity by his shed blood on the cross. Amen? And then the lordship part. Because there's many people, I can give altar calls, and I've given a lot of altar calls, and people come and they come and they come. They have over years and years and years. They will understand and agree uh, full heartedly that there is a deficiency in themselves that needs help. Amen? You hear what I'm telling you? There's a deficiency that needs help. You'd say, you know what? As Paul said, you know, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the very things I don't want to do, there I find myself doing. They'd say, yeah, that's me. That's it. And you would say, yeah, yeah, I see that, I see that. And I'd say, well, you understand that Jesus came. You know, the scripture says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We say, yeah, yes, I get it. Praise God. Jesus paid for it on a cross. And then if I ask, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. If I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I shall be saved. It's with the heart that I believe and I'm justified. It's with the mouth I confess and I am saved. I'm up here. I want that. And then we start to learn some things about the, the transforming, the renewing of our mind. And here's where things get hairy. Romans 12, 1 and 2, right? In view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. How what? What? Okay, stick with me. So, we understand a need for Christ. We come to the altar, we receive, and he forgives us. Anybody that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then we hit the bricks because we try to hang on to our old life. Because we're thinking we're, there's something we're going to lose. Instead of comprehending something. You know that, that song, the last song that was being sang, I'll Fly Away. 
you know, that song, I get lost in it sometimes because in the ministry and all the things that we're working on, one day, one day we, we lay down our last amen, we do our last whatever. We, Dave, one day you're going to take the last pantry van on a run. Amen? One day, you know, the guys that are working faithfully every day, working in the ministries over there doing those things, everybody that's doing what they're doing, they're going to do it for the last time here on earth. And then I fly away. Amen? Did you get that? Do you get that? Amen? All right. So we get that. But you understand the joy in the journey is to get your mind wrapped around this picture of uh, there's a world out there of people that are hurting. And the way that people are motivated to have change in their life is when they see it in somebody else's life. Evident. They don't make changes because you preach at them and tell them all the wrongs they're doing in their life. No, that doesn't attract people. No. That's kind of like the fart in the elevator kind of thing. Amen? Yeah? You get that? In other words, you just point your finger and just keep telling them all the things they're doing wrong. How about you tell them there's a God that loves them so much? That there is a purpose in life that all the frailties, the, the, the things that we're not proud of, all the shortcomings and all that stuff, he's paid for the penalty of those mistakes on a cross. And he says, you know what? You know, the life that you're trying to pursue, it's the wrong one. The pursuit that you need to be involved in is the one that carries its way. When you take your last breath here, you're going to this place in eternity. But bigger than that, that it's not this transition. It's like, you know, a lot of people, they can't get their mind wrapped around the transition from here to there. Because the lifestyle that people live, there is a giant gap in that thinking. Do you hear what I'm saying? So there is no submitting to the authority of God. There is no being transformed by the renewing of your mind. There is no pursuit of Christ on the journey. And there is no evidence of God at work in your life. And as a result, you don't get to see the evidence of the presence of God in people's lives. You don't get to see a transformed life right before your eyes and then watch the years pass as they mature in their faith. You don't get to see that. And so one day as you go down this road with people that have been serving the Lord for years and years and years and you're doing this thing together, one day you go from this dimension to another. Did you hear what I'm saying? I think of Pastor Clark when he passed away. You know, he preached. The day before he passed, he preached. And he was as frail as can be. We had a stool up there. We had to put, he had to be on a stool. But he... His life and the things he pursued, so on and so forth, he, he really started in the last season of life. He started spilling his life into these guys in the church. Just pouring his life into them. Saying, in other words, I'm passing you this baton. You need to get it. You need to get it. And then don't weep when I'm gone because I'm going to glory. And that's where you need to get your mind wrapped around so this transition isn't worlds apart. As in you have no idea what's ahead. So there's this process. And for us to understand the picture that is there, to have faith, to know, to know that God has got your back. It's like, well, preacher, you don't know all the things that have gone on in my life. You don't understand. It's like, oh, listen, believe me, I understand. I understand, and I understand what it is to have the wrong pursuits. I understand what it is to be trying to figure things out on your own, right? I understand what it is to not grab a hold of the Scriptures as God breathed. Do you hear me? In other words, the authority of the Word of God, standing on it. So then I don't have to be looking for a way to shore up my life. I have the stability that comes from the Word. So I'm not trying to rethink that constantly. That's my basis of stability. And so I'm on a journey. And, and the peace that I find in the midst of the craziest days is that I'm under the authority of Jesus. I'm under his authority. And so the mission that's before me has a purpose. And if the mission that has, that's before me has a purpose, then it has an eternal outcome.
and the eternal outcome is what the game is all about. So you hear what I'm saying? It's like sticking with a team that's, that's playing and, and they stink half the season. All of a sudden they come alive. And, and, and then they win, the whole, they win the whole thing. Because at the end, you know what we know? What the scripture tells us? We win. It's already been won. So we're in a lot of these little, little battles. And we don't understand those little battles are a journey that's doing something in our life as well. They're, it's doing something in our life. And we're counterproductive many times. The Bible says all things are permissible, not all things are constructive. All things are permissible, not all things are beneficial. So we go counterproductive. God has us on a mission, and he's directing our steps. And we lose sight that he's the one in control. So we start taking in pulls. And they're usually found in people that surround us, our friends. Especially if we get some advice from a preacher, maybe, yeah. And they tell us something we don't want to hear. You hear something you don't want to hear. So then I just circle, get around me, a group of people that tell me what my itching ears wants to hear. And that's not productive or constructive. Because at the end of the day, the Bible says, he that began a good work in you, he's faithful to bring it to completion. So you're going to be like a dog chasing its tail. Because he's going to do that work in you. So the truth of it is, is we get our mind wrapped around the stability that's found in life is to stand on the Word of God. It's to stand on the truths of the Bible and don't compromise them. So I preach, you don't understand the heartache that comes into my life as a result of standing on that Word. Oh, yes, I do. I absolutely do. But what's the alternative? What's the alternative? So to understand, we have the ability to, by faith, by faith, speak to the mountain and say, uproot yourself, and it casts itself into the sea. We have, by faith, we can do that, right? We know that faith is being sure of things hoped for and certain of things unseen. We know that. And so faith is the vehicle that we accomplish things, and faith comes from hearing the word of God. And that's the spoken word that Jesus spoke, right? That's the one that the centurion said, you just say the words and he'll be healed. You don't have to go anywhere. Your command will take care of it. So in our lives, for us to understand the power of the word of God and what he wants to do in and through our lives, for us to submit to that authority. What does it look to submit to that authority? And therein lies the problem. Sometimes we think entirely too much of our own thinking. Amen? Amen. Yeah? Think entirely too much of our own thinking? Let me ask some questions by an amen. Amen. You have scripture that confronts you. In other words, you're reading the Bible, you're, you're doing a devotion time, or you're underneath the teaching of a, a pastor, a preacher, a teacher, and you're confronted with a scripture that speaks right into your life, and it's completely applicable to your life. Do you respond to it, or you take it into consideration? By an amen, how many of you respond to it? All right. How many of you take it into consideration? All right. All right. Drew did it both ways, and everybody else didn't do anything. Right? Am I right? Right. This is interactive. You can interact with me. It, you don't have to worry. I won't. I won't come down on you just because. <laughs> so it's not the. Yeah. I'll be. It'll be fine. <laughs> it'll be fine. The truth of it is, listen. We struggle with this. Right. We struggle with this. And therein lies the problem. Because we want to see the power of God in our lives. We want to see things change. We want to see God accomplish things through our lives, all those things. But then we want to reconsider what he says. Or we're going to decide when we implement them. It's like, that's a good idea, but let me, let me start that one next Monday. Instead of, how about right now? How about right now? And so there you have it. For me... On this journey, these words were probably the most powerful words that hit my head this week. Is a man under authority, is what, this, what the centurion said. I am a man under authority, and then he began to say, and I have others under my authority. But he started out with that, I am a man under authority. And there's a problem, folks. You hear me? 
you struggle with being under that authority? Do you struggle with the voice of God coming out of the mouth of someone else because he's using somebody to speak right into your life? Amen? Do you struggle with the scripture itself when God just hammers you? You hear, I, I go around and around and around to try to hit the same points to get something that makes a difference in our life. The power of God lived through our lives cannot happen if we don't yield to his authority. It's that simple, right? We have to come to a place to really, really say to God this. You know what? I'm, I'm struggling with faith. Just like we heard the, the scripture that says, you know, I do believe, but help me with my unbelief. Somewhere on our spiritual journey, we struggle with this. I do believe, but help me with my unbelief. I've got a doubt or two in there. In other words, the scripture has just painted a picture for the answer for my life right now, but I have some doubts in there if I want to implement it right now. Do you hear what I'm saying? So exercising faith is faith in action. It's not hearing it or believing it only. It's putting it into action. It doesn't do any good to believe something and don't respond to it. Amen? That's where salvation is received, right? You heard a message, Jesus died on a cross for your sins. You ask, you, you recognize that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. You say, Lord, I want what Jesus did on the cross to count for me, right? I believe he's the Son of God. I believe he was born of a virgin in a manger. I believe that he walked this earth as Emmanuel. I believe that he died on a cross for my sins, and I believe he came out of the tomb on the third day on Easter morning. And because of that, the grave couldn't hold him, and it can't hold me either. I want what he did for me. So that's faith. It's putting it in action. Is coming up to an altar call and asking him for it and receiving. doesn't do you any good to hear it and don't respond. So faith in action in our life, the Bible says it's impossible to please God without faith. And so faith in action is to take the word and put it into action. And then we, can account, then we can count on the fact that you're going to be able to see the power of God lived out through that action. Amen? You with me? So this is where it gets tough. Because what does it mean to you as an individual? What does it mean to you as an individual? Because you know what this soldier said? Just say the words and he'll be healed. Do you believe that God has that kind of power to do something in your life? Amen? Do you believe that God has that kind of power to do something in your life? Do you believe he'll do it for you? All right, two. It's Drew again. I thought I heard somebody else. Did you, did you harmonize with him? Amen. Is that what it was? Listen, here's the problem. There's a breakdown here. Do you hear what I'm telling you? We believe God will do it for somebody else, but not for us. Well, what's the problem? Well, come to the point to say what, what the centurion said. I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. That's an accurate depiction of who we are before we meet Jesus. Because when we meet Christ, guess what happened? Past, present, future sin covered by the blood of Jesus on that cross. And so therefore, that would be not an accurate statement. Once Christ shed blood on that cross, counted for us, then that's not an accurate picture anymore. Then it, then it becomes, we have the right to be called children of God. That's what the scripture says. Right? He paid for it for us. And so for us to understand, we have that authority in our life, not because we earned it, because Jesus paid for it on the cross. And so we can count on, we can have faith, you know, the size of a mustard seed, and we can tell that mountain to uproot itself. We've watched it here. There's so many times we were praying month after month after month down in that conference room in the building of this building with a small group of Christian people that believe God called us to this. And he made it happen. But I'm going to tell you, there was plenty of times we were trembling in the knees and we were saying, God, help us with our unbelief. When people were leaving out of the doors like you wouldn't believe, we were saying, God, help us with our unbelief. 
help us with our own. But we're not moving from this place. We're not moving from this place until one day, one day you're in here and there's services going on and we got people on a Sunday morning, it's blown and going in here. There's people all over the place. And they don't understand or they don't know that at one time the staff was in a room and they were admitting to having faith the size of a mustard seed at times and calling out to the, power, the Almighty God and saying, we need you to increase our faith because this journey's hairy. Amen? But we've watched him move the mountains, and I'm telling you, you can watch him do the same. And the reality of it is to have a sober perspective from Genesis through Revelation. The, the Word of God is solid. It's God-breathed. Right? And so that means in your life, Redemption is found in no other name but Jesus himself. Amen? Right? There is no other name under heaven in which you can be saved. There's one mediator between man and God, and his name is Jesus. Amen? And so what he did on that cross paid for the wage of sin. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So when that gets said and done, you become a co-heir with Christ. You have the right to be, to be called children of God. And so what happens in this whole process that happens, I have to do a lot of other thinking. I have to reboot my natural thinking because I feel inferior. I feel like God will do something for somebody else, but not for me. And so when I think that way, I behave that way. You hear what I'm telling you? And so for a life to change, we have to understand what God wants to accomplish in our life is contingent on us grasping that truth. We have to be under his authority. We have to believe his word. And we have to walk in that light. Amen? Well, every time we get together, I always give an invitation. I always give an opportunity for you to consider some things. And considering those things would be, you know, for you to think about the fact. Did you hear something here tonight about authority that maybe resonated true with you? Did you have a problem with authority? And that that problem with authority could hinder your willingness to walk with God based on what the scripture says. Because we always want to analyze. Well, let me take a look at that first. Right? And that maybe, maybe we just need to come to the place to say, if faith is being sure of things hoped for and certain of things unseen, and I believe that Jesus... Emmanuel came as a baby in the manger. I believe he walked the earth, and I believe that he was crucified, and that he rose again on the third day. And I believe that I'm a person that has a sin problem that needs that fixed, because I can't fix it. The wages of sin is death, eternal death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So if I believe that, then I react, my action would be by faith, I take that measure of action by receiving that. Amen? And then we move on. Now we move on to his lordship. Now we say, God, you did for me what I cannot do for myself. And so on my, my journey of faith, as I'm traveling along this journey, I want to trust you on this journey. So that means I'm not going to be analytical on every verse of scripture that I read. In other words, I'm not going to read 15 philosophers' opinions based on, on the word of God. Then I'm going to take it as the word of God, God breathed. And as a result, I'm going to move forward. Now let me just give you this, and then, then we're going to wind it down. So on my crazy journey of faith, Started out in some pretty rough roads of life that were crazy, that were beyond crazy. And because they were such a mess, I had people that were faithful people praying for me that I now know, but I didn't know. In fact, their faithfulness, their faithfulness was an amazing thing. And one of, one of the things that I would just tell you, folks, just if you're sitting right here right now and you know somebody that, that is lost and out in this world and they're in a tailspin and spinning out of control, pray for them faithfully. Pray for them faithfully because my little sister is one of the ones who did that for me. And I was a, a, a wicked heathen that was just vicious, vicious to her. The words that came out of my mouth were cutting, degrading, 
awful. On a, and that, that was the thing that was consistent. That's who I was. That's the life I lived. And that, that little sister never stopped praying for me. And the day came when my world was crashing around me that that's exactly who I called. I called the one who was talking about this Jesus and never let up. And she's the one who led me to Christ. So when I tell you that, listen to what I'm telling you. I tell you that because the reason I'm a pastor today and not the crazy nut that I was back then is because somebody was faithful and they prayed without ceasing in my behalf. And God got a hold of that crazy person and shook my world upside down. Now let me just tell you that. The reason I'm preaching to you tonight, the reason that this is real to me and that, that I have the passion and the conviction to say and tell you these things when I find a biblical truth that's solid that you can stand on, I bring it and break it before you, is to say the issue that I always struggled with from when I was the youngest, from a dad who was critical and would punish if one of you was in trouble, which was me, all six of you were in trouble. I had a problem with authority, and it was his was the beginning. Worked its way right into law enforcement. What a surprise, right? And because of that, I found something absolutely amazing, that God was able to break through all that garbage. And he did it with a prayer. When I, when I sincerely prayed and asked God to say, you know, legitimately, here in my little sister, she told me so many times the same thing. You need Jesus in your life. You, you need Jesus. I used to say, get away from me, you freak. Until the day I was like, just broken before. I couldn't even speak anymore. And she said, you need Jesus. And she said, she started quoting the scriptures and showing me them in the Bible that you hear me quote here now, all these years later. You're right. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. It's with the heart that you believe and are justified. It's with the mouth you confess and are saved. And I was like, oh God, if there's any truth to what this nut is telling me right now, I want it more than the air I'm breathing. And I wept, I broke and wept on the floor. And I knew something just happened. Did you hear me? Something just happened. So it wasn't somebody talking about some scripture. It wasn't some preacher trying to tell me something based on his opinion. It was God Almighty forgiving the sins of a heathen who deserved hell. And he gave me life in Christ. And I got up off of that floor broken. And my world was changed. And I knew that I started to have heartfelt feelings for the things that were sensitive to the heart of God. And nobody can convince me anything different. Because I lived it. And I live it today. And so what I'm telling you is to understand if you struggle with submitting to the authority of man, parent, school, police, authority, right? Government. If you struggle with that, perhaps you struggle with submitting to the authority of God Almighty. And if that's the case, that's a problem. It's a big problem. And the best way to come to terms with it is to understand that God's love for us, he sent Jesus to die on the cross. And, and so if you've come to terms with that reality, if you're here tonight because you believe there's a God in heaven and that he has a son named Jesus and that he was born of a, a virgin in a manger and that he walked earth and he, and he died on that cross... And then he rose on the third day. If you believe that, forget about the other stuff you're struggling with from Genesis through the Revelation and leave that to faith, being sure of things hoped for and certain of things unseen and watch what God does. Amen? Well, here's your opportunity to respond. I always give an invitation. So then that invitation is a time that you get up and that's what it is. You heard me talk about faith in action, right? Faith without action is dead, right? Right? So faith without action means I believe it for you, but I don't believe it for me. 
But if I believe it for me, if I say, yeah, I've got a problem with authority. I have a problem submitting myself to any authority. I think I am the ultimate authority. I'll say, well, preacher, I don't think that really. What does your actions indicate? What would the testimony of others in your life, what would that indicate? Do you think somebody might say, you're not easy to, to instruct? Would somebody say, you have a problem with authority? He do what I'm telling you. He do what I'm telling you. Because to submit to what God wants to do in your life, you have to come to terms with these things. And for us to expect to have a change in our life, what does the scripture say? Do not be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Right? And that's where it all starts right here. Works its way to here. Into action, habit, lifestyle. And so if I'm expecting a change and I want to see God do something mighty, I'm going to have to step out on this limb called faith. Sure of things so far and uncertain of things unseen. And so it's like, God, I want to have a change. I want to have a change. And I know this. If you heard anything tonight, here it is. This faith thing requires us to submit to God's authority. And you know what his chain of command is? All authority has been given to Jesus. Right? On heaven and on earth. Right here. Jesus. There is no mediator between man and God but Christ himself. And he made that possible. But what was lost in the garden, he paid for on the cross. And that relationship is restored there. And that's what it is, folks. So wherever you are tonight, if there's never been a time that you've come, you know, physically come and said, you know what, Lord, I want to receive what Jesus did on that cross for me. I want to receive that. You never did that. You need to do it tonight. We'd be happy to pray with you up here. Nobody will be looking. Well, they'll be looking at you. They're not going to hear you. I'll shut my mic off. They won't hear a thing. We'll pray. We'll tell you what that means to, by way of a prayer, receive what Jesus did on that cross for you. But if you've done that and you say, preacher, my problem is as I'm traveling this journey of life, I look just like I did when I first asked Jesus to save me because there's been no renewing of my mind. And when I have conflict, I don't go to the scripture to find the answer, not just to prove my point, but to have God direct my steps. Preacher, there's none of that going on. Well, that, that this is the day we need to to draw a line in the sand and say, you know what? This is the day it changes. This is the day that we're going to submit ourselves to the authority of God and let him have his way. As the music plays, counselors, if you'd come on forward. Anyone that you see coming up here right now, you can pray with any one of us. As the music plays, would you respond?
Father God, we thank you for this time. God, I just pray that you would help us as we go from this place. Would you help us to submit to your authority? Would you allow us to allow your word to transform our lives? And would you let this world see something that looks different than our own understanding? And would you help us to believe that we would have the ability to speak to a mountain and say, uproot yourself, and it will obey us. God, we have a lot of those in our life, things that are immovable. We can't see any way that it would be possible for something to change in our life, but yet you have the ability to command it, and it be so. So, God, we just ask that as we go from this place, we begin to stand on your word as the infallible word of God, God breathed, that we would accomplish what you've called us to. Help us not to shrink back, God. Help us not to succumb to the popular polling of those who are around us. Help us to stand on your word. And then, God, we pray that you're glorified in all we do and say. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you.